The King Cobra, Ophiophagus hanna, celebrated as the world's longest venomous snake, asserts its dominance in Southeast Asian habitats, measuring up to an impressive 18 feet with its distinctive hooded neck and sleek appearance. While typically avoiding confrontations with humans, instances of territorial defense can result in unfortunate encounters. Despite the inherent risks, this did not deter Irma Blue, a 29-year-old Indonesian pop singer renowned for her audacious performances, often featuring pythons draped around her neck. The historical backdrop of individuals performing with snakes extends to ancient cultures entwined with religious and mystic practices. In the contemporary era, this tradition has metamorphosed into entertainment, with performers using various platforms to exhibit their fearlessness. However, a heightened awareness of responsible practices and animal welfare is emerging, acknowledging potential risks for both performers and the snakes involved. Irma, accustomed to using pythons, decided to incorporate a king cobra named Rianti into one of her performances. Notably, the cobra was rumored to have undergone defanging, an illicit and ethically controversial procedure aimed at removing the snake's venomous fangs. This was considered a precautionary measure to mitigate potential risks and ensure Irma's safety in case of unexpected circumstances during the performance. Irma midway into her performance accidentally stepped on the snake, triggering a natural defensive reaction. The cobra, feeling threatened or in pain, responded by biting Irma, gripping tightly and injecting venom into her thigh. A snake handler had to intervene, pulling the venomous serpent away from her. Irma, displaying both determination and a lack of awareness of the potential consequences, decided to continue her performance for an astounding 45 minutes. Despite the venom coursing through her veins, she not only entertained the crowd but also refused any treatment for the snake bite, including the administration of an antidote. Whether perceived as courageous or a self-imposed death sentence, Irma's unwavering commitment to her craft became a poignant part of her final performance. Cobra venom, known for its complex composition, introduces neurotoxins that induce paralysis, cytotoxins causing damage to tissues and blood vessels, and hemotoxic properties leading to coagulation abnormalities. These multifaceted effects can manifest as spontaneous bleeding, clotting disorders, and fluctuations in blood pressure, potentially culminating in shock. It is imperative for individuals bitten by venomous snakes like Irma to seek swift medical attention to counteract these venom-induced complications and enhance the chances of survival. In Irma's case, the refusal of treatment underscores the intricate balance between determination, artistic dedication, and the inherent risks associated with handling venomous creatures. During an electrifying 45-minute performance, Irma experienced a sudden and alarming medical incident, characterized by violent vomiting and distressing seizures. Following this unexpected turn of events, she tragically collapsed on the stage floor. Swift emergency measures were implemented and Irma was promptly rushed to the hospital. Despite the dedicated efforts of the medical team, her condition proved irreversible and she was pronounced deceased. In the quiet countryside of Buttsfield, County Durham, Albert Dryden's self-built bungalow stood as a testament to a man's defiant pursuit of his dream. Little did anyone know that this picturesque scene would transform into a shocking episode etched in British broadcasting history. Albert Dryden, born on May 12, 1940, in Consett, County Durham, was a man whose life journey unfolded as a tapestry woven with eccentricity and legal conflicts. As the fifth of eight children born to Albert and Nora Dryden, his upbringing in the steel-making town of Consett was shaped by the influence of a strict, clean-living father who worked for the Consett Iron Company. From an early age, Dryden displayed a solitary disposition and an active imagination, often lost in flights of fancy. Academic pursuits were not his forte, with later IQ tests revealing his intelligence to be well below average. In the early 1960s, Dryden appeared in court twice, once for firing rockets and mortars, and another time for threatening local farmers. He even pledged to move to Argentina to pursue his hobbies undisturbed. Despite these legal entanglements, Dryden's passion for weapons endured. In 1982, having been made redundant, 
Dryden took a pivotal step in realizing his unconventional dreams. He rented a plot of land at Eliza Lane Buttsfield, where he would construct the bungalow that would later become the focal point of a tragic saga. By 1984, he had purchased the land outright. In the tightly knit community, Albert Dryden stood as a benevolent figure, renowned for his kindness and readiness to assist others. A genuine community man, he devoted his time to repairing children's bikes and addressing various maintenance needs with unwavering generosity. Despite the results of IQ tests, Dryden's ingenuity extended to the construction of rockets of such magnitude that they even registered on the Royal Air Force's radar. Facing the impending demolition of his whimsically named Home in a Hole, Dryden had meticulously constructed it from the ground up. However, a significant hurdle stood in his way, the absence of planning permission. In the UK, the acquisition of land does not grant unrestricted freedom to implement any desired architectural design. Prospective landowners must seek approval from the local council for their proposed designs. Albert Dryden, undeterred by multiple rejections, persistently applied for approval, determined to build according to his vision. Despite facing continuous refusals, Albert Dryden pressed on with constructing his own projects following unsuccessful appeals. The situation took a dramatic turn when an unidentified informant alerted the council to Dryden's ongoing unauthorized construction activities. This revelation marked the beginning of a series of events that would unfold into a significant drama. The clash with Derwentside District Council reached a pivotal moment, placing local planning officer Harry Collinson at the epicenter of a tumultuous storm. With a tenure dating back to 1974, Collinson was a seasoned council officer, adept at navigating the intricacies of planning and governance. The clash unfolded as two individuals from disparate backgrounds grappled with finding a resolution to the escalating issues. Despite attempts to connect over shared interests in nature, tea sessions and discussions, Collinson remained resolute in his stance that the home needed demolition. The conflict reached its zenith in 1989 when complaints arose about Dryden's bungalow. His creative explanations, ranging from it being a new summer house for his elderly mother to a nuclear shelter and a cattle shed, only intensified the council's scrutiny. Multiple rejected applications followed, leading to a public inquiry, a failed appeal, and the unfortunate passing of Dryden's mother, an event he attributed to council persecution. The amicable understanding between Dryden and Harry Collinson, the council officer, dissipated, replaced by a sense of betrayal. In May 1989, the council's decision became official, ordering the demolition of the property. Despite Dryden's subsequent appeal in January 1990, inspectors ruled in favor of the council, sealing the ominous fate of the unconventional abode. Dryden was given three months to demolish the bungalow. Dryden's confrontations with the council escalated, reaching a peculiar climax when a friend hurled a live cockerel at planning officer Harry Collinson during a meeting. In September 1990, the council attended the land to assess whether Albert had demolished the home. Finding it still intact, they gave him another month to comply or face prosecution. Defiant, Dryden refused to comply, leaving the council with no choice but to carry out the demolition themselves. As the media, police and council prepared for the event, the potential for trouble loomed large due to Dryden's well-known obsession with guns and arms. The police were instructed to withdraw immediately if met with any resistance from Albert setting the stage for a tense and dramatic confrontation. The forced demolition was to go ahead on the 20th of January, 1991. The BBC was on site, capturing the unfolding drama for Look North, a magazine programme. Dryden, an eccentric character with an obsession for weapons from a bygone era, emerged from under his baseball cap, brandishing a vintage First World War Webley Mac 6 revolver. The scene was surreal, with the gathered press, police and council officials seemingly unfazed by the firearm, dismissing it as an empty threat. Dryden mentioned that their presence was illegal as he pointed out the active appeal letter on his front gate. However, the appeal Dryden had highlighted 
had already faced rejection, with the impending arrival of the rejection letter in the next few days. Tensions escalated as Albert engaged in a heated argument over the legality of the house. When Harry asked for entry through the main gate, Dryden adamantly refused, leading to a confrontation. Harry Collinson then warned Albert that they would have to use force to access the property, potentially involving breaking the fence. In response, Harry emphasised that any damage to the fence would be Albert's liability. In a chilling retort, Albert warned Harry, you may not be around to see the outcome of this disaster, now you've been warned, and if you had any sense you would go away. Harry was still persistent in his stance, so Dryden shot Harry Collinson. As the cameras rolled, Collinson fell backward into a ditch. Chaos erupted, and Dryden proceeded to in the face and chest. He also targeted the demolition machine, firing at its internal mechanisms in an attempt to disable it. A police unit swiftly arrived, and Albert Dryden took cover in a caravan, claiming that the property was rigged with landmines and traps. Later investigations revealed that all these threats were fabrications. During the ensuing mayhem, Tony Belmont, the program's presenter, found himself wounded, but managed to report the shocking incident to the camera. A police officer was also shot in the rear end, a casualty of Dryden's desperate attempt to defend his unconventional castle. The subsequent trial in Newcastle Crown Court in April 1992 resulted in Dryden's conviction for Collinson's murder, the attempted murder of solicitor Michael Dunstan, and the wounding of Belmont and PC Stephen Campbell. Despite Dryden's claims of defending his home, he received a life sentence. In prison, Dryden maintained his defiance, showing no remorse in letters to Roy Collinson. His appeal was dismissed and parole applications were rejected. In 2017, suffering a stroke, Dryden was released on compassionate grounds. His health declined, and on September 15, 2018, he passed away in a care home, leaving behind a legacy of defiance, tragedy, and a bizarre chapter in British broadcasting history. The tale of Albert Dryden, the man who sought to defend his castle with a vintage firearm, had reached its final chapter. A quick heads up, once you see some of these photos, you can't unsee them, so just brace yourself. Potiers, France, 19th century, a seemingly calm town hiding a tale of horror and torment. At the center of it all stood Blanche Monnier, born on March 1st, 1849, into an affluent, respected family. Blanche's beauty was legendary, a bewitching allure that drew admirers like moths to a flame. Marriage proposals came pouring in, but little did she know her life was about to descend into the darkest depths of human cruelty. In the year 1876, at the tender age of 27, Blanche's heart was stolen by an older lawyer, a man of intellect and charm, but her mother, Louise, was having none of it. Louise, a woman of unwavering determination and an extremely dark heart, saw the lawyer as penniless, a union she'd never allow. In a twisted fit of rage and desperation, Louise hatched a plan. She locked her own flesh and blood in a tiny, lightless dungeon concealed within her attic. There, Blanche would be condemned to endure the next 25 nightmarish years of her existence. As the sands of time flowed on, Louise and Blanche's brother Marcel continued their lives, hiding behind the facade of a grieving family, while Blanche's life transformed into a living, breathing horror story. Friends and neighbours remained blissfully ignorant of the unimaginable atrocities occurring right under their noses. Even Blanche's own father, lacking in assertiveness, allowed his wife to take charge. Tragically, the lawyer Blanche loved met an untimely demise in 1885, forever unaware of the gruesome fate that had befallen her. Blanche's mental health, trapped within the confines of her own home, deteriorated steadily. She began experiencing hallucinations and refused to eat in the shadow of existence and under the relentless dominance of her mother. Blanche endured her suffering in solitude, hour after hour, minute after minute. The household servant carried on with her duties as usual. To what extent she was aware of the situation, 
and was complicit in it remains uncertain. An anonymous letter sent to the pair's Attorney General on May 23, 1901, would expose the nightmarish truth. The letter read, Mizur Attorney General, I have the honor to inform you of an exceptionally serious occurrence. I speak of a spinster who is locked within Madame Monnier's house, half starved and living in putrid litter for the past 25 years. In a word, in her own filth. Authorities stormed the house and what they uncovered would scar the souls for eternity. Blanche was found in an unspeakable state, her body frail and caked in filth. Insects swarmed around her, and her prison resembled a chamber of horror that defied description. Twenty-five desolate years devoid of sunlight or hope. One officer at the scene painted a picture of the horror that awaited them. He said, the unfortunate woman was lying completely naked on a rotten straw mattress. All around her was formed a sort of crust made from excrement, fragments of meat, vegetable, fish and rotten bread. And we also saw bugs running across Madame Mademoiselle Monnier's bed. The air was so unbreathable, the odour given off by the room was so rank that it was impossible for us to stay any longer to proceed with our investigation. Louise was arrested but fell gravely ill Succumbing just 15 days later, Marcel faced a trial but escaped conviction, declared mentally incapacitated. But our story doesn't end here. Blanche's life, even after rescue, was plagued with severe mental health issues. Diagnosed with an array of disorders including anorexia nervosa, schizophrenia, exhibitionism and coprophilia, she found her final refuge in a psychiatric hospital where she eventually found peace passing away on October 13, 1913. A courageous man named Vladimir Komarov found himself in the middle of a perilous mission. The date was April 23, 1967, and the Soviet Union had chosen him as the pilot for the Soyuz 1 mission. From the outset, Komarov was acutely aware that this journey into the cosmos was destined to be his final one. The Soyuz spacecraft had revealed its vulnerabilities during rigorous testing, displaying issues and flaws that left no doubt that any individual embarking on this mission might not return to Earth. The dangers were unmistakable, and the expectations from the Soviet High Command were relentless. Adding to the weight of this decision was his close friendship with cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, the trailblazer who had become the first human to journey into space. Gagarin stood in line for the mission if Komarov was to step back. It was a moral conundrum of cosmic proportions, yet Komarov, resolute and unwavering, made the ultimate sacrifice. He chose to confront the looming peril himself, sparing his friend. As the Soyuz 1 set off on its mission, space revealed its unforgiving nature and catastrophe struck during the re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. The spacecraft's parachute, the last hope for a safe landing, failed. Komarov and the Soyuz 1 pierced through the Earth's atmosphere at an incredible speed, heading for an inevitable disaster. In those last heart-wrenching moments, Komarov faced a terrible fate. The fiery descent of the Soyuz became his final resting place. He perished in the flames as the spacecraft plummeted into Earth, becoming the first human to meet such a tragic fate in space. Even before his ill-fated mission, Vladimir Komarov had a premonition of his destiny. He had an unyielding sense of duty, and maybe an awareness of the sacrifice he was making, knowing that his chances of returning safely were slim. He made a powerful statement. He asked for an open casket funeral, as a way to force his superiors to confront the consequences of their decisions. On Christmas Eve 1945, a horrendous fire swept through the Sodder residence in Fayetteville, West Virginia, forever changing the lives of the Sodder family. George Sodder, a proud Italian immigrant, and his wife Jenny, and nine of their ten children occupied the residence. Circumstances surrounding the tragic fire led to the surviving Sodder family to believe that the missing children might still be alive. The Sodders were a close-knit family who had left Italy to build a new life in America. George had a successful trucking business in West Virginia, and they were known as one of the most respected middle-class families in the area. 
However, their outspoken criticism of the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini had created tension in the immigrant community. In the week leading up to the fire, strange events occurred that fueled the family's suspicion. An insurance salesman angered by George's anti-Mussolini remarks threatened him, stating that his house would go up in smoke and that his children will be destroyed. A mysterious car parked along the main highway often watched the young Sodder children as they returned from school. On that Christmas Eve, the family celebrated their older daughter Marion, surprising her younger sister with new toys. When the children asked to stay up later than usual, Jenny allowed it, on the condition that the older boys complete their chores. At 1am, Jenny was awakened by a loud bang on the roof. She smelled smoke and discovered that a fire erupted in George's office, seemingly caused by an electrical fault. Frantic efforts to save the children in the attic were in vain as the fire quickly consumed the stairwell. Despite desperate attempts to reach the fire department, they couldn't save the five missing children. The fire chief's response was delayed and their own trucks failed to start. After the fire investigators found no remains, this left the Sodders to question the official explanation. The lack of bones, the persistence of the children's Christmas lights and the unusual discovery of a missing ladder raised doubts. The family initiated a request for answers, hiring a private investigator and offering a reward for any information that would help them find their children. They put up billboards, but the case remained unsolved. Rumours and sightings added to the mystery, and witnesses had claimed to have seen the children in the car during the fire, and a hotel owner in Charleston reported encountering them with two Italian men and women. The Sodders also received a photograph that they believed was their missing son, Louis. Efforts to uncover the story continued for decades. The Sodders remained convinced that their children were possibly taken by the Sicilian Mafia as retribution for George's anti-fascist views. Despite the lack of definitive evidence, determination to find their lost children never wavered. As the years passed, they continued to publicize the story and investigate leads using modern forums and media coverage to keep the case alive. While some believe the children perished in the fire, others remained open to the possibility that the Sodder children escaped, leaving the story of the disappearance shrouded in mystery, much like that Christmas Eve night in 1945. Asha Degree was born on August 5, 1990, in Shelby, North Carolina, USA. She went missing at the tender age of nine, under circumstances that continued to baffle investigators and the public alike. The fateful morning of February 14, 2000 was marked by heavy rain and howling winds. Inexplicably, Asha packed her book bag and left her family home situated north of Shelby, embarking on a journey that would raise more questions than answers. As she began to walk by the North Carolina Highway 18, several passing motorists noticed her. One of them turned around trying to offer help. But when the vehicle drew near, Asha fled into a nearby wooded area leaving everyone bewildered. Morning light revealed her absence to her distraught parents, and a frantic search commenced that very day. Personal items were found near the spot she had last been seen, but the enigma deepened. It wasn't until a year and a half later that her book bag still packed emerged from a construction site by the Highway 18. A billboard now stands at the point where she ran into the woods, a plea for help to find her. The Degree family life was one of close-knit simplicity. Along with her brother named O'Brien, she lived a life centered around family, church and school, shielded from outside influence. They had no computer in their home due to her family's protective nature. Asha, a fourth grader in elementary school, experienced a regular day leading up to her mysterious disappearance. She played in a basketball game which her team lost. Though she was upset initially, she seemed to have recovered quickly supporting her brother in his game later. The events of that fateful night were inexplicable. Asha and her brother went to bed, but shortly after, the lights went out due to a car accident nearby. The power was restored at 12.30 a.m. with both children appearing to be asleep in their beds. However, Asha mysteriously left her bedroom between 3.45 and 4.15 and witnesses saw her walking along the rain-soaked highway. The subsequent search was extensive and intensive. Investigators initially believed that Asha had ran away but couldn't find a clear reason for her to do so, especially given her young age and content within her family. 
Years later, authorities concluded that Asher had likely been abducted in 2015. The FBI made some efforts to solve the case, offering a substantial amount as a award for information. The mystery surrounding Asher's disappearance garnered national media attention with TV shows and documentaries highlighting her story. Asher's family remains a strong recess in the public eye, hosting annual walks to remember their daughter and keep her memory alive. They persist their search for answers, clinging onto the hope that one day, Asher will walk back through their door. Despite the passage of time, the disappearance of Asher continues to haunt the public's imagination and serves as a reminder of the enigmatic nature of some unsolved mysteries.